Hey everybody, welcome to the Make Work Human podcast. I'm Larissa Hain. And I'm Jen Baggett, and we are so excited to have you with us. In this series, we are going to be digging into vulnerability. Specifically, we're going to be looking at the difference between professional vulnerability and personal vulnerability. We're going to look at some of the myths around vulnerability, and we're going to bust some of those myths. We're also going to take a look at some organizations that are, are incorporating vulnerability very well, and some that aren't so well. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but I am so excited about this topic because vulnerability, and especially that professional vulnerability, is the base of what it takes to be able to be fully human at work, right? And that's what we're doing here. We're making work human. Absolutely. So join us over the next six weeks as we explore vulnerability. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Make Work Human podcast. I'm so excited for today's episode. Today, we are interviewing one of my favorite people on the planet, uh, Mr. Arande Creighton. Arande is, is a dear friend of mine, a mentor, a big brother, just one of, again, one of the best humans that I know. And he is a, a leadership coach and consultant. Um, he does a lot of work with the leadership circle. He does a lot of work with Dare to Lead, and he's just an all-around awesome guy, and I can't wait for you all to meet him. Arande, thank you so much for joining us. So well, thanks for having me, and it's uh, great to be with both you and Larissa, and excited to uh, just have a, a great conversation this morning. Yeah, definitely. So I know you. You and I are buds from, from way back, but yep. Larissa doesn't. Our audience doesn't. Yeah. Um, would love for you to share something with us that maybe only your friends and family know? Oh, goodness. Uh, something only my friends and family know. That won't be too embarrassing. That's the, that's the caveat that's there, the right? <laughs> you, you know, so during this quarantine time, probably um, one of the things I got back into was bonsai plants. So I've got bonsai plants out on my deck. Uh, I've got two right now, a Chinese elm and a mini juniper, and uh, waiting to get a 12-inch juniper in here probably in the next week. So that's become my new, uh, my new thing. So, uh, yeah, just watered them right before I jumped on the call with you. I don't talk to them. You know me well enough, Jen, that I don't talk to the plants. Um, <laughs> I do talk to them probably when I'm trimming them on the weekends, but, uh, but that's about it. So, yeah. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. That sounds really fun, actually. So, Arande, why don't you, I know I kind of introduced you the way I know you, but yeah. why don't you tell our audience a little bit about what you do and why you do it? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. I always say I got into this, this area of coaching and organization development sideways. Um, so I started off my career actually uh, doing family and juvenile uh, work, um, some more in the social work arena, got quickly burned out from that transitioned into corporate and didn't know what the heck I was getting into. And uh, I ran call centers for a number of years and I come from a teaching family. Uh, my mother was a teacher. I have uh, cousins, aunts, relatives who are anywhere from teachers to principals to superintendents. And, uh, and I actually taught when I first got out of school and, and I always had this itch to how can I help my teams get better? Uh, and, you know, running, having your own budget responsibilities, your own p &L, you could always slip in a little bit of training budget. So I would go out, I'd get certified in a program. I'd come back, I'd teach my managers and my teams, you know, so I did uh, Franklin Covey, uh, Seven uh, Effective Habits of Highly Successful Leaders. I did John Maxwell's programs. And, uh, and then I was put in a position where I could um, kind of jump into this realm a little bit more on a full-time basis and uh, actually worked for John Maxwell for a number of years uh, and decided it's time to go back to school and do something more. And I uh, got my master's in uh, organization development. And uh, that was, goodness, that journey started about 15 years ago and just really started working the circuit, as I call it. I've been internal. I've been independent. I've worked for consulting firms. Um, but it all came out of this passion of what I taught myself, what I learned, both through experience, um, through a lot of failures uh, and getting back up. And then how could I take those same lessons and apply it to other people so that they could grow as leaders? Mm, I love, I love that. I love hearing your story. It, 
And for those of you who don't know, Rhonda is actually the one who inspired me to get into this business, this coaching and consulting business. We actually went to coaching school together um, as well, which is so cool. So I've, I've been able to really be on this, the latter part of this journey with him, which has been really fun. Yeah. 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 You've been right there. Yeah. That's awesome. So, I, I mean, what an amazing backstory and twisting and different programs and all amazing stellar programs. So I'm curious, what ended up leading you to get into, you know, Dare to Lead and, and that idea of vulnerability and daring leadership, with, especially with Brene? Like, how did you get there? Yeah, you know, um, that was actually, it's funny you ask that, Larissa. So um, one of the instruments I use quite a bit, as, as Jen's already alluded to, is Leadership Circle. And I happened to be going through um, the second level certification on the leadership system, which is the Leadership Development Program. And uh, while I was out there in Utah, this was, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, probably about six years ago, um, uh, Cindy Adams pulled me to the side and she was like, you probably would really like this Brene Brown. And I'm like, who? Brene who? I'm like, uh, you know, who is this person? And so on the flight back, I downloaded onto my tablet uh, Brene's first two TED Talks and uh, watched them over and over. And, uh, and then just from there, started reading. I started off with Gifts of Imperfection, which um, actually, believe it or not, I think it's the 10th or 15th anniversary. I think we just got an email from her about that. Uh, and just really appreciated this concept of vulnerability being tied into courage and, and the way I like to frame it, being tied into doing something that's greater and bigger than us. Mm. Uh, and so I really just appreciated that. And uh, uh, when she decided to do uh, Daring Way, I was like, ooh, that's really cool. But Daring Way had more of a social work counseling focus. Uh, and so when Dare to Lead came out and that opportunity, uh, I said, you know, what do I have to lose? And so I think it was November of 18, I put in my application. Uh, I got notified January of 19 um, that I had been accepted to do the program and then went through certification uh, November of last year. So. Uh, that's kind of been the trajectory of getting involved in that work and, and just really see it. It's such a enhancement to anything that any other coach or consultant is already doing. It was so cool that you got to go through that and you got to go through it with Brene, right? Yeah. So there were two, three sessions that she did last year. Uh, I think it was maybe February, February, March, September, and November. And she taught them all. They were in San Antonio. Uh, and so, you know, it was really, what I have always appreciated, and I've had the privilege of working with a lot of speakers and a lot of folks, is when you see the same person off stage mm -hmm. that you see on stage, and that's exactly how she is. Um, and uh, so it was, it was a fun program. It was packed. There's probably 120 of us in, in my session, uh, packed in for three days, but uh, was just truly um, both enlightening. And I think the thing I appreciate is the fact that she and her team live out those values. Um, so she's very open about what she's continuing to learn and grow in. Um, and we've seen a lot of that as part of our practitioner community this year um, as she's expanded to, to be uh, intentional about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and how that's expanding the circle and expanding the work and how she's so leaning into that when many people, quite frankly, are pulling back from it. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually it's such a great point. And when, you know, this work, Jen and I talk about this a lot, is that understanding ourselves and, and how we interact with people leads, you know, that's the foundation of being truly inclusive, right? So Absolutely. how do you see this work impacting organizations from that, you know, inclusiveness and diversity perspective? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think to first understand how it impacts organizations, you have to understand how, how Brene has set it up to impact her world and her practitioners. And so one of the things that happened um, probably around May or so is she created a diversity, in, uh, equity, inclusion, and belonging uh, committee. Eight people, global background, all ethnicities, uh, genders, um, and really worked to create what is the statement that Bieberg, uh, Brene Brown Education and Research Group, is going to stand by. And therefore, what are we expecting you all as facilitators to stand by? And so um, that took us through journeys of being on, on uh, Zoom calls with her and, you know, what is it that this is what I'm going to expect and you're going to have to sign off on these statements. And even in doing that, there was a reworking of some of the armored versus daring um, leadership behaviors. Um, there was reworking of language to be more inclusive and in, in understanding 
um, where we've gotten so, um, uh, I'll lightly use the word callous and understanding the origins of certain terms that we use. And so really kind of clearing all of that out. And so because we did all of that, then it makes it easier to take that work into organizations. Uh, and so, you know, I think it, it all goes back to the vulnerability and especially when we talk about inclusion, um, being vulnerable means that you got to go deep within yourself. Yep. Right. Yep. And to me, there's two different types of, of coaches. There's those that can go deep and those that skim the surface. And I think the benefit of being able to go deep is I can always come up, right? If you can swim in 10 feet of water, you can get up to the three feet, right? Yep. But if all you can do is be in one foot, you're going to drown when you try to go deep. And so I think that to me, what happens with her work, uh, both as a practitioner and as a, as a coach is it forces me to have to go deep within myself and then use that as an opportunity to connect with my clients and also have empathy because, you know, some of this stuff is hard. I mean, when we, when you talk about a, an armored behavior of being a knower and being right versus being a learner and getting it right on the daring side, man, it takes a whole lot to say, yeah, you know, I get caught up in my own stuff and the fact that I got to know all the answers and it's really uncomfortable for me to let go of that. We've got to bring that to the surface first as coaches and practitioners and admit, even when we show up in the room and we've already had the signed contract and gotten, you know, half the payment up front, you know, we make sure we take care of everything, right? <laughs> but then it's like, oh my gosh, I'm really going to be here with the CEO oh my gosh, I'm really going to, I'm in this group, in this room right now. And what comes up in us, you know, that causes us to do those kinds of things. And, and that's where we've got to kind of lean into it and breathe in it, right? And just be able to be totally okay with this is the crap that's happening in the middle of me right now. Um, and it's normal. And I just got to take a deep breath, lean into it and be okay with it. Yeah. And then so beautifully put because, you know, no matter how much you've done with this work, studying directly with Brene, like this is a constant and life mastery. <laughs> this yes, is work that happens practice. all the time. So Absolutely. You know. Absolutely. And there's, there's different things that can, that can bring it up, that can trigger it. I mean, you know, I'm sure all the three of us have all had our moments during, you know, quarantine, right? Where, oh, we work from home. We can handle this, right? Yeah, but we don't work from home with three other people in the house all the time, you know, in my case or in Jen's case, right? You know, we don't work from home. I mean, I can, I can let the dog go run around, right, Larissa? You, you know, you can let the dog out and not worry about it. But man, 24-7 for now, what are we about to go into our sixth month, right? Yeah. And so what does that mean? And for me, part of that recognition was being able to have an honest conversation with my family to say, my travel schedule, while I know it might feel crazy for you guys, because I'm on the road 50 to 75% of the month, has provided the balance of I can go out and get my time that I need as an introvert and then kind of come right back in with you guys and be fully here. So to be here all the time is like driving me crazy. And being able to admit and own that and realize it doesn't make you a bad person, it doesn't make me a bad coach, consultant, husband, father, it doesn't make any of that, it just makes me human. Yeah. Oh, so, so good. Like that's modeling that vulnerability. It, it doesn't just happen at work too. I think people think like it happens here, but I don't do that here, but right. you have, you yeah. have to kind of do it across the board. Absolutely. Absolutely. We want to compartmentalize. Right. And, and I think that on some levels, that's what this notion of work-life balance has put us in this framework of is work-life balance means that, you know, I keep working this nice, pretty little box over here. And then I have life in this nice, pretty little box over here. Just as I've got life happening now, I've got a teenager who's got to get stuff off the printer, you know, because she's in the middle of school, right? Yep. But this is what happens. This is what happens. And so there's an integration of life that there may be some times that we're working 10 o'clock at night. There may be some times that 10 o'clock during the daytime, we're doing something else. And so I think that that's what we have to understand is, is and especially in quarantine, is helping us see this. It's all one big confusing and, and crazy looking blob of stuff that's going on. Yeah, so we true. blew up the paradigm of work-life balance. Absolutely. All of this. Sure did. So then thinking about that, how would you, how are you talking to leaders about vulnerability and, and helping their, their people through like be vulnerable during this time? 
Yeah. You know, um, as I was thinking about this concept of vulnerability, I, I think that what's really important, um, and I first saw this come up as I was being asked to do a lot of racial equity and racial justice work, it starts with conversations. Yeah. Many times we want to, um, we want to operationalize vulnerability, right? We, we want to have it as part of our KPIs. We want to have the checkbox. We want to take the magic wand and poof, you know, vulnerability has now invaded our workspace, right? <laughs> but it starts with conversations. It starts with us being able to say, why is it so scary for me to be open and vulnerable? Why is it so scary for me to admit I don't know everything or I'm scared? Or, you know what, I had the perfect plan coming into 2020, and I've got no idea what we're going to do now because my world's been rocked. Yeah. So I think that when we can have the conversations, and to me, that's the power of vulnerability of being able to talk and recognize you're not the woman or man on the island by yourself who's dealing with this. Mm. Right? Yeah. Because it's, it's in that moment that those thoughts begin to, when we have them over and over again, they form their own philosophy, if you will, in our head. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, they then have us. It's like the story. The story has us. We don't have the story. Yeah. Uh, and so there's something about doing that. You know, if, if, if I can, Jen, if I could share a story, a, a me and you story. Of course. Um, I remember um, Jen and I had an opportunity to do a workshop together. And um, uh, she knows I have complete trust in her, her skill set, her ability. What she brings is phenomenal. And we were starting off the workshop and I was like, something's going on, what's going on? And she looked at me, she said, you know what? You know I look at you as a mentor. You know I look at you as a big brother and I don't wanna mess this up and I don't wanna make you look bad. And you, knowing Jen well enough, I knew that that was sitting in the back of her mind. But to, for her to be able to verbalize it and to have the courage, right? Because yeah, we're doing work together, but there was a relationship that we had that said, I don't want to mess this dynamic up, right? So the courage it took for her to just open up and admit that was, was awesome. And it caught me and I said, just be you and it's going to be fine. If I didn't think that you were the right person for this, I wouldn't put you in here, right? And it was so awesome because that program, she... She took and ran so many elements of that program. It's so funny, Jen. I, I talked to one of the participants in that program yesterday who's gone to a different company, and she'd sent me an email. She was like, I have this opportunity. I thought about you and Jen because all the stuff that you guys did, and it was so awesome for me. But that's the impact that we can have on people when we bring our full self to the table. And vulnerability allows you to bring your full self to the table. Otherwise, we're bringing a mask. So true. So true. You know, what's really funny, Aranda, I actually shared that same story from my point of view on our last episode. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. Right. So, so yeah, now I got to make sure I got to write a note to listen to the last episode to, to hear your perspective on that. So yes, awesome. definitely. And, and as a, you know, a listener of both, it's such a great example of how being vulnerable can change the trajectory for so many people, right? Um, because it's not just about us and our stuff and whatever's going on inside of our head. And, and, you know, you guys are in tune enough where Aranda, you saw that there was something going on. So you brought it forward and that vulnerability based trust helps in that relationship. Um, yeah. but who you impacted down the line is even more like, imagine if Jen, had you not said anything, those people wouldn't have gotten the full impact of you. And this that's right. That's right. That's right. You know, my, my dad raised my sister and I with a simple saying. And, you know, when you're a kid going through it, you hate it. You're like, oh, my gosh, you got to memorize every little saying my dad has. But he would always say, nobody can beat you at being you, mm. but you. And, and so I think that, that when we talk about vulnerability, we need to keep that in the back of our mind, right? Nobody can beat us at being ourselves, but me, right? And so what's going to get in that way? If it's not being honest with myself, if it's not being honest and open with others, that's going to get in the way, mm. right? We don't want to be carbon copies of somebody else. I mean, we all have, have, have mentors and folks that we look up to, whether it's in the coaching arena or as parents or whatever, um, but we should just be pulling some small snippets 
from those individuals and merging it into who we are, not trying to be that other person. Yes. Totally different thing. Totally different thing. I'm, I'm really curious now. So as you're doing this work and then following up, you know, people do love KPIs, but yeah. how do you see this once this work is being done, how do you see it impact an organization or a team or a leader long-term? Yeah. And, and that's why I love Brene's work because, uh, you know, one of the, it's a very basic self-administered assessment that we use called the, the armored versus daring uh, behaviors. And what it allows someone to take a look at is where are you on the spectrum? So going back to that example I used before, the armored example is being a knower and, 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 and being right. Yep. And the daring example is being a learner and getting it right. So on a scale of kind of, you know, one to three, which, which paradigm are you more in line with? And so many times being able to do that at the beginning of time with people and then after you've taken them through some sessions, doing it on the back end allows them to see the growth. And then when you pair that with perhaps the subject object interviews to be able to say, so tell me a little bit about what you see in Larissa now, because you, you told me some things before and I'm curious to see the difference. That's where people get it. It's really the stories of the experiences that, that tell the, the uh, you know, the full journey that you've been on. Uh, and I think that that's an important thing. Brene always likes to say her work is either a base coat to kind of set up what you're going to do or a top coat to gloss off what you've already done. And so I think having the flexibility to bring it in in either way. And, and we know as coaches and consultants, many times we bring in a lot of things um, that are conceptual, that are theoretical, but how can we show them behaviors? You know, I'm, I'm looking at my tablet and, you know, when I look at being a norm, being right, you know, not knowing is often perceived as weakness. Um, we often buy into the belief that, that knowing is the only value that we bring. Asking for help is often perceived as weakness. How are you evaluating yourselves on each of those versus curiosity is encouraged and framed as courageous? Or we operate from the belief that leaders don't always have all the answers, but often ask the right questions. Mm. And then asking for help, normalizing that and having it expected at all levels. And so now what we're doing is we're actually giving people concrete opportunities to see what exactly do those things mean. And so I think that that's, that's really valuable as it ties into the KPI side of it and the measurement side for those people who are, you know, kind of that, that brain side of them is what kind of gets them alive on this stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. How, do you, how do you see this transforming organizations? Oof. You know, um, I, I think that the, the, the importance and the value and the vulnerability, and, and like I said, going back to the conversations, is just recognizing that we're all human, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, you know, I, I think as, as we go through a global health pandemic, a global social pandemic, um, you know, weather that's crazy, who knows what the next thing is going to be coming up, coming around. The power of being able to have just non-judgmental conversations. One of the things that I, I've been doing since, um, uh, since George Floyd's murder was reaching out and just having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. You know, what is it that you want to ask that you don't want to feel judged on? You know, what is it that doesn't make sense to you? Mm. And what, surprise, what surprises most people is, wow, we have an opportunity to have that dialogue. And there's a way that we have to be able to do it that doesn't deny your truth yes. and experience and doesn't deny mine. Where we can sit in, in the muck of the discomfort of the moment and be okay with it. And, and I think that that's what I'm beginning to see a lot of now is um, you're starting to see coaches who unfortunately have gotten into our field, um, but either because they haven't done their own work or because they don't understand that, that the discomfort is part of what we do, um, aren't able to sit in this. And that's, that's alarming. You know, I've, I've long said that coaching in 21st century is what consulting was in the 20th century. You know, I'm old enough to remember that when people didn't have a job, they said they were consultants, right? And, and you're kind of seeing that now, right? You know, I mean, I'm a life coach. It's all life coaching. So, okay, I get that, right? But are you able to truly go deep? Are you able to do that 
with yourself. I mean, I, I just met with my coach yesterday. We meet every two weeks, you know, um, but it's the conversations and it's being able to talk to one another without judgment, to be able to share the truth of my experience and not feel like I have to diminish that because it may offend you or make you feel uncomfortable. Um, and I think that that's the key is when people can get to that point. Um, you know, one of our, our requirements at, at Beberg is, is um, we can't go in and act like we know all the answers when it comes to these diversity conversations. But we also, we also all committed to not stifling them when they come up mm. and just let them roll. And for some people, that's going to be like, this feels crazy because I had the agenda down to a 10 minute time box. And we all know what happens sometimes the agenda goes out the window. <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally. Oh, there's so much good stuff there. So much yeah. good stuff there. Oh. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> I am speechless because I, hearing you speak about it, you can just hear the depth in there and hear the passion and, and hear the impact of what it can be on other people's lives to have these kind of conversations. And especially now, you know, whether it's, you know, I talk about everyone has their like big issue that has been spotlighted during the pandemic like whatever your junk was before it is on fire right now yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and you can't ignore it anymore right and that's also what we're kind of seeing reflected in what's happening in the country and what's happening with you know um so not only being a coach but being a leader like you have to lead your people through these conversations if that's what you value and that's what you want your organization to stand for yeah um but you got to get right with it in yourself first. You got to be able to sit and have that conversation you first. You do. And, it, and it's not easy. You know, I mean, I, I, again, always willing to use myself as an example. I, you know, I had a conversation with my CEO about a week ago um, that I have not had for three months mm. that I had to lean into and say, look, here's the deal. Here's the experience I'm having. You know, here's, here are the examples of these experiences showing up. Um, and it wasn't comfortable. It wasn't comfortable at all. But at the end of it, to have him look at me and go, wow, I, yeah, needed to hear all of this. And, and this, this has not been comfortable, but it's been a good discomfort. That was telling, you know. And for him to say, I know how much courage it took for you to have this dialogue and this conversation, right? And sometimes those are the, our, our gremlins in our head tell you, oh, you have this conversation. <laughs> Just go on and put your resume together. Just go on and tell all your friends. Yes. They're looking, because this ain't going to go well, right? But that's not, that's not the truth of it, because sometimes it's more comfortable and it's easier to be held captive to our old stories, yes. to be held captive to the situation. Um, and it takes a whole lot of courage to bust through that. So much courage. Yeah. And if we stay where we are, we, you and I talk about this a lot in the work that we do, if, if we're playing not to lose, yeah. we end up just staying stuck in this box. We have to, we've got to play to win and playing to win means I'm going to, I'm going to take this shot. Yeah. Is it scary? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's Alexander Hamilton's, you know, song from the opening, right. You know, I'm not going to miss my shot. Right. You yeah. know, Yep. I mean, and you've got to do that, right? But here's the other thing that I think that we have to understand as individuals, be that coaches, be that professionals, whatever we are, there are going to be times where you standing in your truth means that you're moving. Yes. But everybody else may not be moving with you. Yes. And sometimes, and I know for me, it's happened where I've moved and I'm like, where, but, but they're back there, right? Yeah. And, and so you kind of want to go back, but you know, in order to do what you're truly supposed to be doing, you've got to remain forward. It, it's it's kind of like that, that matrix Neo moment where you busted out of the matrix and you see everybody else there and you're like, I'm out, but these are my people and I want them to come with me. But that's not, that's not my role in this right now. You yeah. know, that's not my role. You know, I, I always like to say, you know, some plant, some water, some harvest, you know, and, and maybe you taking that step to the next level plants the seed for somebody else who's like, maybe there is a better way to do this. Maybe mm -hmm. there is a more courageous way. Maybe I can do X, Y, and Z, right? 
Yeah. And that's what we have to go with. So every single bit of that is based in that being with the discomfort of being vulnerable, right? It's all, you know, a lot of the words that we're using of like courage and, and that all come from that moment of like, oh gosh, I do not want to do this. This is icky. This is uncomfortable. But, and you know, you said it in the beginning, there's something bigger on the other side that right. means more that yeah. is pulling me across. That's so, right. you know, I, this conversation has been amazing and there's so much inside of it to unpack. Um, yeah. You know, and you've touched on basically every part that, you know, in our, our six part series, we could do it all here. Um, yeah. But I think just boiling it down to like one nugget, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm wrap um, these with, if you could say one nugget of all of this that you want people to get, what would that be? Yeah, it, you know, it just feels around... Um, not being afraid to to lean into who you know you're supposed to be mm. and uh i i think um I, I think kurt cobain had a quote you know to to be to be a copy of someone else is uh to disgrace who you're who you're supposed to be right and so there's something about us just leaning in um, as we're growing, as we're getting better and getting bigger, whatever that might mean for us, there's something about leaning into that discomfort um, so that we can bring out the best version of ourselves. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of where I would, I would put it. Love it. I love it. Larissa, so much good stuff. I think my nugget today is like sometimes you have to move forward alone and like it's okay. Yeah. It's, and it's not always going to feel safe, but if you want to be, if you want to do the things you want to do. So if you're an individual contributor and you know that this is something in the workplace that is valuable, take, be willing to take the step. Maybe you might have to leave, but maybe that mark will make a difference. Absolutely. That's awesome, Jay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think my little nugget today is the, the story you shared about going to your CEO is that so often we live inside this trap of assumptions of what either what other people can handle, right? Um, and we limit ourselves and, and what we get because we're assuming what other people can handle. And, you know, standing in that and you're like, hey, maybe I got to put a resume together <laughs> and get out there with the rest of the 60 million people looking for a job. But, yeah. um, you know, that again, big enough to move forward. But don't assume what other people are going to say. You don't know once you have that conversation. And if you're doing it in a truly grounded, vulnerable way, um, yeah. it, it really can transform a relationship. So I love that. Thank you. That's awesome, Larissa. I love that. So thank you so much for joining us today, Ronnie. I think we could have probably <laughs> gone for like hours. <laughs> so, you know, I love talking to you. <laughs> yeah, no, this is great. I enjoyed the experience and uh, looking forward to hearing all the episodes of the podcast. Fantastic. So join us next time when we will talk all about like ways, different ways we can look at using assessments in measuring and looking at vulnerability and how do we bring in more courageous um, behaviors into the workplace. Thanks everybody. See you next week. See you next week.